In 1985, work began in England to build what were to become known as the finest recording consoles in history. Focusrite's mission was to produce no compromise mixing consoles for the greatest recording studios in the world. These consoles were to lay the foundations of a brand that is still at the pinnacle of recording technology to this day. Only 10 Focusrite studio consoles were ever made. This is their story. I work for Focusrite. I am Artist Relations Manager. I'm in and out of studios quite a lot. You meet someone randomly in a studio somewhere and they'll say, oh, I used to work on the Focusrite console in X location. They always have a very strong opinion on, on how it was to work on. It's almost like they talk about it like it was their friend, like an old mate that they haven't seen for a long time. So people have really fond attachments to these pieces of equipment. And I want to tell the story of who worked on them, why people love them so much, and track them down. Rupert Neve started Focusrite back in 1985. He produced the ISA 110 module as a, as a project for Sir George Martin for VS Studios consoles. That led to their becoming a, a line of, of products, the ISA 110 and the ISA 130 notably. Based on the success of those products, uh, he started to become asked uh, if he would produce a console. You know, Rupert had originally planned to build four desks as the first production run with the new company. Two were finished. One for Electric Lady and uh, one for Master Rock in London. And they sort of created a bit of a buzz in the marketplace and it probably was the last large format console, that Forte series. Uh, there a lot of very sterile and a and neat combination of transformers and the way he designed it gave, thing, gave it a certain sound, people liked that. At that point in time, they were running out of money. Because the cost of developing the console was just so high. I was a co-founder of Soundcraft and after 15 years um, we sold the company. It was left with nothing to do and money in the bank. Very dangerous combination. With Rupert's company in trouble, Phil acquired the Focusrite assets and assembled a team from his contacts in the British audio industry. The new Focusrite was born, and the team set about designing a console based on the sought-after ISA 110 Mic Pre and EQ module. The idea really was to, to take the ISA 110 as a starting point and build the best sounding recording console, having it do one thing really, really well. We were all young, so it was very exciting. and. Um, but once you started doing it, it was non-stop. It was living and breathing there, virtually sleeping there. We were a small team. We were, you know, spending hours uh, constructing the idea, and then hours making the prototype, then hours getting the, the, the parts made. It was very hectic, but we, you know, we, we kept going, we kept pushing, and the net result is a console which is still in use today, 20 years on. And I think really it is, it is the last great British console. There's nothing been built of that size or of that quality of since. Probably the most famous of the consoles is in Studio A at Ocean Way, Los Angeles. It's in that room that Frank Sinatra made most of his records and hits recorded at Ocean Way have sold, in total, in excess of a billion copies. There's the mama and papa is singing California Dreamin' in this space. And here's my buddy Bill Putnam with Nat King Cole in Studio B. I put my glasses on so I can see some of these things here. That's Quincy Jones with Sinatra in Studio A, you know, going back a few years. The actual building we're in dates from right around 1900, so it's one of the oldest buildings in Hollywood. From 1961 on, Sinatra recorded every album that he did, generally speaking, in these, either Studio A or Studio B here. Here's an interesting picture of the console in Studio A, you know, 12 inputs, and these are basically bass and treble controls for the left and right side. And here's our Studio A. When Phil took over Focusrite and straightened out all the issues and came out with this initial console, there were a lot of things about it that were pretty spectacular from my standpoint. It had enough inputs to do what we needed to do and it was extremely easy to operate, very functional and the noise floor was so low, it was very impressive. 
you bring it up and you think the speakers are muted. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it's still impressive in that regard. We tend to modify everything <laughs> as part of our deal. And so we have made a lot of changes, but it's a darn good sounding console. I really started spending time in this room about 94, 95. It just went on for 15 years, one thing after another, after another, after another, I never left the room. One was with an artist called Tricky. And I remember Tricky came in and I played him the mix and Tricky pushed himself back from the console and he looked at me and he said, I always have people come up to me and tell me that I'm sexy and that I'm dangerous. And I never understand what they're saying because I don't think I'm sexy and I don't think I'm dangerous till today. And I listened to that mix come out of the speakers and it's like, it's sexy and dangerous. You've helped me understand what people see in me. Over the 15 years, I did a tremendous amount of like trying to find things that are better or worse. And I was never really able to beat the mic preamp, which is shocking. On acoustic guitar, on drums, anything really acoustic, I don't think it's touchable. Another console to be sold to the US was number nine, which went to Bear Tracks, the studio belonging to Jay Beckenstein of jazz fusion band Spyro Gyra. All these stones in the walls uh, created wonderful diffusion. And I love the way my instrument and others sounded with nice high ceilings. So when we found this barn, we really thought we had found the perfect place for a studio. The studio buildings are sadly no longer in action for recording. Instead, the building is now a private residence. I just remember Bear Tracks being totally idyllic and a great place to work, just warm. And everything about the monitoring, the audio path there was just absolutely hi-fi. And, and, you know, the console was a perfect match for that studio. Two of the coolest things about the studio where there's an enormous chamber. That was reverb chamber number one. And this silo here was reverb chamber number two. There was a mic at the top and a speaker at the bottom and we lower the mic for different things. So these two are our live echo chambers and they sounded terrific. Jay's studio console was number nine of ten, manufactured when the recording industry was in a state of change, from analog tape-based recording to digital audio workstations. When we bought this console. It was at the very, very, very beginning of what became the digital revolution in recording. At that point, uh, the SSL consoles had, had uh, uh, pretty much taken over all of the, the, uh, the larger studios. It's computerized mixing and there's a lot of uh, value in that for modern music production, but uh, not for tracking. I was amazed at the size of the sound and the openness of the top end and the kind of natural quality it had. Everything sounded outside the speakers and there's just a size to those consoles that nothing else had. In its heyday, boosted by its close proximity to New York, Bear Tracks was a true hit factory. Artists as diverse as the Wu-Tang Clan to Dream Theater, Mariah Carey to Bjork, all used the unique facilities and the Focusrite console at Bear Tracks. We thought we had maybe 10 years of analog ahead of us, and I think we were wrong. We had far less time than we thought. The Bear Tracks console was decommissioned and kept in storage for several years, until it was purchased by SST Studios in Hoboken, New Jersey, just over the river from Manhattan, and less than 40 miles from the console's original location in upstate New York. It needed love, but we got it, you know, through time and patience, it's clean as a whistle now. In a time when everybody's going one way, I try to go in the other. You know, I mean, everybody's breaking it down and making it simpler, but there's an inherent faith that great records still get made a certain way. So that's going to go around twice, right? It's a very complicated console, but it was very easy to use, very well thought out. The sound, the fidelity of it is just something you're not going to find in today's modern music era. It's just straight up pretty to look at. I mean, especially when you light it up. It definitely looks fantastic in a studio. Um, which is important, you know? I mean, it's obviously the most important thing is what it sounds like. The way we perceive sound is very subtle, and most people don't actually appreciate the subtlety that goes on. They just know it sounds nice or they don't like it. And it's very hard to describe 
that kind of emotional experience you get from from a quality of sound. It's what you feel, what you dream maybe, what you want to hear, and you try to achieve that with the possibilities you have. There are preamps that that kind of add a lot of colour and a lot of character to sound. The ISA preamp doesn't do that. It adds a certain character, but it's very subtle. It's, it's kind of full-bodied, it's weighty, but it's still, at the same time, it's still transparent and it's still very clean and crisp and open and it's faithful, but with a little bit of extra colour. It is transparent, like a modern console, but it, it's muscular like an, like an older Neve. It still has that depth and that realism to it, this, the imagery and the definition that so much modern equipment just won't offer. The EQs are fantastic. I'm a, like a bass freak and I always wanted to get the massive kick drum sound, you know, especially with rock bands and stuff, and they, they always want as much kick and bass as possible. If you just start pushing 30 or 40 hertz, that's uh, it was really easy to get off those EQs, just, just by sweeping. Another much-loved feature of the studio console was its three stereo mix buses that could feed submixes to the final bus. The mix bus on this particular console is, is tremendous. We have three stereo buses that we can mix together. It's very, very complex, uh, simple, but complex at the same time. I was always into, you know, kind of cranking up the far fields and basically just riding the, the mix buses. Drums, there's your guitars, there's your vocal, and you just let uh, kind of like the band mix their own thing. You'll just watch people sit there like, oh my God, this is amazing. Much of the studio console's sonic success can be attributed to the design of the ISA 110 mic pre and EQ module. Rupert Neve's approach was to find the best of everything, so a lot of the components are military standard. I got together with Focusrite's head of product development, Rob Jenkins, who installed most of the studio consoles to get under the hood of the ISA 110. So this section here is the high low pass filter section and you have RC networks that make up each of the filters. You've got individual resistor and capacitors for each of the frequency steps. One of the remits with the console was to keep it as faithful as possible to the Neve original circuitry, so that what you'd end up with is something that sounded um, how you expect it to sound all the way through. We went through uh, the channel and we calculated the perfect resistor value for every op amp stage to get the right balance between noise distortion and, and, and heat. It was that sort of level of refinement which is something that you can't get elsewhere. This stage here is the parametric stage. Gold contacts, military spec parts. These are the individual gain step resistors. 40 dBs of gain on, on this stage here. Then you have 20 dBs of passive gain in the Lundahl transformer. Transformers are the electrical component that every input signal on the studio console travels through before getting to the mixing architecture. They provide isolation and clean gain and retain the highest audio quality at all times. The minor differences in, in, in design of transformers, the, the size of the magnetic core, the size of the, the thickness of the, the wire used, the, the type of metal, everything has its impact on the sound. Very subtle differences that make it, actually make a big difference in sound. Further sonic improvements were achieved by the Focusrite team by rethinking the mixing architecture of the console. It was built in buckets of eight channels, which were each summed locally, keeping noise to a minimum. They had their own power supplies, they had their own sonic amps, so there were no long buses to become noisy and problematic. So there are always eight channels summed together, and those are summed together in one central mix bus. If you are slightly pushing one bucket to the limit, it does not affect another bucket. Many of the studios that first bought the Focusrite consoles have either closed or upgraded to newer, larger equipment. Our journey to track the 10 consoles down took us to a number of private studios, including Powertone in Belgium, which belongs to Wouter van Bell. Turns out that Wouter is a Belgian super producer. In 2011, he was a judge on the Belgian version of the Idol TV series. And just like Jay Beckenstein at Bear Tracks, he converted a huge old barn into a purpose-built studio and filled it with his stunning collection of instruments and recording equipment. 
The centerpiece is Focusrite console number 7, which was originally installed at Sound Design in Tokyo, before going to a studio in Switzerland and then to Wouter's place. My decision to get the Focusrite console is because I've been working in my professional career, let's say for my 20, 22, on Focusrite as the main uh, preamp for my recordings. It's one of my tools I, I use uh, to try to achieve what I dream of. Um, and it's a fantastic desk sound-wise. I've made, like people say, some historic albums on, on that gear. And for me, the preamp, the focus right preamp and equalizing was very important because for the, for the most important parts, I used focus right uh, recording vocals. Everything, every, every overdub was recorded by those two equalizers. Like helium, without being aggressive. I'm hypersensitive concerning sound, so I'm always looking in my life for something which gives me shivers. I like the sound of paper, people reading newspapers, the, the sizzling sound, it gives me, it, it, it gives me peace. We track console number six down to the outskirts of the Spanish capital, Madrid. Initially installed at the Music Mill in Nashville, Number 6 gained a reputation on the city's booming country music scene. Once Music Mill closed its studio, it was sold to a young engineer named Victor Castellanos. Victor had been working at nearby Sonoland Studios, but when that closed, he took all the money he'd saved from productions and engineering jobs and bought the best console he could find. In need of a studio space, Victor came to an agreement with his father to install the console in the spare bedroom of the family home, what is now known as Turtle Studios. Yo desde muy pequeño siempre he querido ser astronauta o algún o piloto, alguna cosa que estuviera al control de alguna máquina. Fue la idea de mi padre decir, ¿por qué no montas aquí la mesa en vez de conseguir un local que vas a tener que pagar las facturas, la luz, todo? Aquí lo lo tienes ya el local gratis, digamos, ¿no? Vinieron aquí y fueron pidiendo piezas del equipo y poco a poco se las subieron. Lo que pudieron ellos hacer lo hicieron. Duró algo más de una semana. Fueron ocho días y medio, porque ya luego se tuvieron que ir. Fueron más o menos unos ocho días. De, completamente todo el día trabajando y un trabajo muy fino. Cuando la vi por primera vez, quedé enamorado de la mesa. Considero que es... Es como una forma de arte, la construcción, el diseño, todo. Esto es otra cosa. ¿eh? Recording at Victor's is certainly a unique experience, and not only because of his console. Al, al no ser, como te digo, un, una cosa tan seria, tan estás en una casa, oyes a mi madre que grita, oyes un teléfono, tal. Es, es un ambiente como más relajado. It's, it's a home, it's a perfect place to be, to create, to relax and just work. It's not uh, anything like a studio, another studio is what I record. You know, it's, it's kind of a special thing you know, to find that stuff here in that uh, environment and that neighborhood. You know. Tengas lo que tengas, yo considero que tiene que ser poco y bueno. O sea, no me sirve de mucho tener muchos cacharros. Prefiero ahorrar ese dinero, guardarlo, 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 comprar luego al tiempo, aunque tenga que esperar un tiempo, comprar algo que realmente merezca la pena y que te vaya a durar, sobre todo, yo considero, para toda la vida, ¿no? O sea... This is number three at Studio Drive in Tokyo, Japan. Hi, my name's Chris from Focusrite. Because four of the 10 consoles went to studios in Tokyo, I wanted to find out what it was about the Japanese recording industry that made the Focusrite sound so attractive to them. From my research, I found two of the consoles in their original locations. First stop was Studio Jive, who bought console number three in 1991. It was initially a 72 input console, 
but when the studio moved premises a few years later, they cut the console down to a 56 input desk in a 48 channel frame by installing some of the 110 modules above the monitor section. <laughs> It feels very rock and roll in this room. There's amazing Gibson guitars and there's an old Gretsch there that looks very old and very special. The leather's cracking. It's beautiful, really. It's like to see the sweat that all these engineers have put into this console. Focus light is natural. It's 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 natural. There's a rack of 1176s here, LA3As, there's some really kind of grungy, tubey processors here, whereas the Focusrite is renowned for its kind of crystal clear, amazing high frequencies, very controlled bottom end. Mic Primo EQ is good. But, what's the most important thing? The most important thing is the filter. It's a lot あの、かかりがソフトなんですよね。EQ にしても何にしても。その、なんて言うんでしょう。ソフトな感じが。ですね。あの、優しい感じというか。えっと、あの、他のコンソールにあるような派手さはないんですけれど、うん、あの、上ま
So these machines are uh, they're so unique that you have to have a maintenance engineer full time who really knows what they're doing. There must be 200 pages of circuit diagrams here. It's probably a bit of a pain in the ass, to be honest, to keep maintaining this thing. But there must be something about these consoles that really is magic. And I think that's why they're still here. They sound so amazing and people have such emotional attachments to them. But it's, it's really fascinating. Right now, damaging winds are blowing from southern New England across... Shortly after our first trip to SST in New Jersey, home to console number nine, Superstorm Sandy hit the east coast of the USA, sending a huge storm surge up the Hudson River and into the SST buildings. The entire facility was destroyed by water damage. The control room and the Focusrite console was immersed in four feet of salt water. Everything was destroyed. Well, it's, it was... So the stage used to be there? Correct. Whoa. A bit different, uh, a bit different than you remember. I see, I've got the, the hairs are standing up on the back of my neck. I remember that little statue guy. Mm. So yeah, the, the control rooms there used to walk through here. There was like a little room here, right? Right. Yeah. With like the mixing desk. Hey, Ken. Hi. Nice to meet you. It took a while to be able to actually get into the place. You know, it was a few days before the water subsided and we got a chance to take a look at things. The water came underneath and was enough to get up about three quarters of the console. Right about, right about here, about halfway up the bucket. The extent of the damage uh, is, you know, it, it was as, almost as much as you could, as you could do. No one's prepared for that kind of devastation. I mean, it, it, it's like a war zone. It just was uh, unstoppable. The uh, concept was to get the center section and a bucket of eight um, to, to survive, to, li to live again, and uh, then take it from there. I just feel like I've got to follow this through and help him get this thing back uh, to life. It's just, uh, we can't lose another big room, great room. So um, that's what we're going through at the moment. The biggest and most impressive studio console was number five, which went to Bop Studios in South Africa. You're hearing something coming through now? There you go. My name is David Stroud. I'm a singer-songwriter uh, from Joburg. When I walked in here, I wasn't actually aware that I was going to be seeing what I did. I was... It's amazing. It took me a while to just take everything in and understand what the, the pristine place I'm actually privileged to see here. Never in my life I've seen an installation of this grand scale, this uh, elegance, this complexity. This is just mind-blowing that this is in Africa and in Mafeking of all places. That was awesome! That was awesome! We had been approached by a, a French-Canadian uh, engineer called André Perrault, who was contracted to essentially design the whole facility. I was the project manager to start, and, uh, and after that I became managing director of the, uh, the facility when we opened. Um, for some reason, Isaac Case was in South Africa and met with the, uh, the president of Papua Botswana, and they were talking about trying to import some talent from America to, to help promote Papua Botswana that at the time was independent from South Africa. So Isaac simply said, well, what you guys need to do is build a top recording studio and put uh, you know people in place. And so there were Tom on the plane, Tom Italy on the plane, Thomas Rast, the architect, and myself. So we had the private plane and we were just flying around in this amazing, you know, a uh, field of animals and all this, and they say, well, just pick where you would, uh, you, where you would build. With an astonishing $30 million budget, Andre specced gear that would live up to the amazing reputation that Bop quickly gained. From buying the largest Neve, SSL, and Focusrite consoles of the day, to installing Vanden Hull silver wiring throughout the complex. I knew very well Focusrite, and so I said, well, why don't we, you know, try to 
get a console fully made of uh, these, this technology and all that. So then, you know, the, the whole thing rolled out of that and then everything was totally best we could uh, we could think of. We're just going to drop in. You're going to start play when you feel the need. The focus right console. It's the most beautiful sounding disc that I've ever worked on. The sound is just amazingly smooth. You see now that part over there, I was supposed to cut the bar earlier. I'm not the kind of engineer that faffs too much with EQ and compression. So if I get a signal through that sounds perfect from the first get go, it puts a smile on my face. Okay, let's shoot up. The focus is not an inline desk. Uh, so obviously you'd have to have a channel that you're gonna have your mic come in on and you're gonna route that out to your tape machine via a group. We used to run either 24 track analog machine uh, for majority of our sessions or the 48 dash. Because of the size of this disc, you know, we had more than enough inputs and outputs on this disc. After a spell in the hands of the South African Broadcasting Corporation, BOP closed in 2003 and has been largely non-operational since then. When we had all three rooms going, oh, it was a fantastic atmosphere. It was an influx of artists and people day in and day out. Producers, engineers, guitarists, drummers, percussionists, vocalists, everywhere, around every single corner. We used to be a a group of people that worked here as well that, that really clicked. If something needs to be done at this time of the morning when you get a bright spark, we'd all be in it together. The current owner has big ambitions for Bop and the determination to revive the historic facility to all its glory. My vision uh, for the future is to, to create a, a hub, a arts and culture hub, not just for, for the country, but for the continent and moreover globally. Can we have a handshake? Yes. Uh, the three of you? I would like to see it bustling with music production. So that's what it's, why it's been built, designed for top-end music production. I see young upcoming stars here. I see us training, uplifting uh, the youth. Uh, I just see the place buzzing. The BOP console was always going to be the hardest complete console to get to due to its remoteness. But there are some consoles that will never be seen in all their glory again. Number one, which was originally at Metropolis in London, was broken down into racks of ISA 110, some of which can be found at Snap Studios. The centre section, however, remains in action. Having fallen in love with the console at Metropolis, engineer Richard Wilkinson is in the process of bringing the master section and two buckets up to working order. Console number two served at Conway Studios in LA for a number of years and is still remembered fondly by studio owner Buddy Brundo. It really sounded great. It was a beautiful sounding console. I was very happy with it for a long time, but then as the amount of channels we needed expanded, we had to go a different route. After Buddy sold it, console number two went to Paramount Studios in LA and then was broken up, just like number one. But it was to live again in a near miraculous twist of fate. In late 2013, SST still needed a console to replace the flooded number nine. Billy comes to me and he goes, I think I found your console. I said, what are you talking about? Said, There's a Focusrite in Texas in a storage warehouse. It was a tiny garage and it was just jam-packed. Everything from uh, artificial Christmas tree to, you know, just all kinds of personal junk. And then all the way in the back, you see these uh, bits of the focus right sticking out of this corner and that corner was completely disassembled. All the parts are there except for mic pre EQs and dynamics, which is all the stuff that we saved because it was high enough on the profile of the desk that we were able to pull them out and they were unaffected basically. It's like the barn finds to the classic car enthusiast. Everything appeared to be Good. It looked like a Focusrite console, you know. Once we started actually seeing what was going on in there, there were first huge physical differences. 
A lot of the wiring changed, the motherboards changed. This console has eight stereo returns. The old one had four. This console has two mix buses and a final bus. Number nine console had three. Number nine had flying faders. This one's got GML. This console has no compressors in it. Our number nine console had eight compressors in it. The connectors for the 110s were female, so those didn't line up. And so we used uh, turnarounds, just DIN connector turnarounds that we got. Um, but that made the modules way too high. So we uh, lowered those motherboards down about an inch. The DIN connectors are backwards. So we actually took the, the ribbons out and we snipped them on every single you know, pin and then we flipped them over, connected them back to the teeth. We did that for each 64 pin DIN on each 110 on 64 110s. I gotta believe that their faith in the amount of work that they put into this process has value. I've got to believe that that's going to actually transfer into the environment and the artists are going to understand that. The Focusrite console is clearly something that is very, very special. And to a lot of people, it can't be bettered. It is the pinnacle of audio design. If John Hanty could go and replace the Focusrite with something that sounded as good, he would right now and his studio would be back up and running. Do I wake up in the middle of the night going, are you out of your mind? Is this crazy? Have you made a huge mistake? Absolutely. What are you going to replace the focus right with? Uh, the sound of this console and the flexibility of it. I don't want to give up on that. You know? It's a leap of faith. It's a belief system. And it's also all I know. For the real stuff, there's a real market. The idea is to maybe try to bring some of that back. Or at least have a tool that the people that get it or still get it can say, well, at least I have a place where I can go work and feel comfortable about the work I'm doing. At least this gives me the opportunity to say maybe, just maybe, I got one more shot. The Focusrite Studio consoles were responsible for the sound of countless huge hit records over the last 25 years. That same dedication, that same focus, uh, it, it underlies everything we do. The reason why we do it is because A, we want to make stuff that sounds good, and B, we want to help people make music. Those values aren't going to change. We will keep making the best products we can that are relevant to how people make music. They'll sound great, and they won't get in the way of the musical process. That's our purpose, that's what we're here to do and uh, we'll carry on doing it for as long as we can.